Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Woodbury Church of Brethren, and I'm so glad that we are able to worship together in person this morning. Um, it is a thrill. Um, it is, by the way, because of how well you guys do um, with keeping up with the recommendations that we give you guys that we did feel um, comfortable still meeting in person. So kudos to you guys. I know um, for some of you it's very uncomfortable, uh, but we do appreciate the opportunity to keep meeting in person uh, for worship. Um, just a couple announcements. Um, for the youth, we do have youth tonight. We are playing the Unlock the Box Christmas edition, which is basically just an escape room, except you're not escaping the room, you're unlocking a box. So it'll be a lot of fun. You don't have to put up with my teaching teams. You just come, play a game. Um, we'll have snacks and stuff. It'll be awesome. We also have a YouTube small group this Tuesday. Um, if you guys missed it, the paintings from past, this past Wednesday's paint night are out in the little kitchenette area. Um, the youth and Kathy Miller did a great job with those. Great job, Kathy. You're an awesome teacher. Um, so way to go there. We are then going to take a break um, with youth until January 3rd, but starting January 3rd, we are going to have our youth worship band small group start Sunday night, 5 o'clock. Youth again will start at 6, so it'll be super convenient for you. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Nobody else gave me one, so that was just a shameless plug for the youth group. Um, our preparation thought this morning. Comes from Isaiah 51:11. The ransom, ransom of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. We pray with him. God, we are just uh, so thrilled to be able to meet together and uh, join and worship God. And we just invite you um, to join us, God. We uh, we know that you're you're always around. Um, but God, I just pray that we would be just recognizing of your presence here and that you would be uplifted by the worship we bring in. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, I'm going to invite Chris and Meredith Rose for the Advent candlelight.
Thank you, Lori and Wendy. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. It's coming from Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse 14 through 20. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud to Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. Daughter Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where
where they have suffered shame. At that time I will gather you. At that time I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. You may be seated. Steve and, and Cheryl over for the, getting the poinsettias and, and putting them up this uh, this weekend. We uh, we had to rearrange some of them so that you could see the ladies as they played this morning. But uh, we're, we're we're thankful for that, and I, I greatly enjoyed uh, the ladies playing this morning. And what made it even a bit more special is to hear the sound of a little child in the background as the music was being played. I, I think the point was made maybe in one of our, our, our later services, uh, how blessed we are to have uh, families who bring their little children here, and if they're making a little bit of noise, do not worry about that. That is a blessing to the rest of us to hear those voices. We're, we're just so thankful that you, you do bring your children in. And, and we can, while we can't, you know, hug and crowd around like we, we might normally, we, we can at least enjoy the, the sound and, and enjoy them being with us. So thank you so very much for that. Um, I also have to admit that uh, at one point during the week, as I was preparing this message on joy, I was sort of assuming that we would not be meeting this morning that we would have to shut down and uh, while it I suppose shouldn't have impacted the message the message that I had was a little bit darker <laughs> uh, probably a little bit more more frustrated I know and, and we'll talk about the fact that that joy should uh, should transcend all of those things but uh, at, at one point I was thinking that almost rather than having an exclamation point after how great our joy, I had a, a question mark during the week. But I'm, I'm so grateful that we are can gather here together, and hopefully my message will be a, a little a little lighter in tone in some places than it was when I was uh, concerned for that. The other thing I, I will mention is we're going to be looking at a number of, of other verses uh, in the book of Zephaniah. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to turn there, it would be helpful. I, I can imagine some of you are saying, okay, I have no idea where Zephaniah is. Uh, it's page 1486 in my Bible, if that helps you out at all. Um, actually, it's between Habakkuk and Haggai, obviously not alphabetically. That probably doesn't help you either. It is the fourth to last book in the Old Testament. So if you find the break between the Old and New Testament and just thumb back, uh, towards the front of the Bible, several chapters you will come to to Zephaniah, and you will be you'll be in good shape there. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we can come together as a body, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to worship you this morning, uh, especially in this very very special time of the year when we. We celebrate your birth, and with all the things going around us, we want so much to have a joy and a, and a celebration and, and something good and, 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 and positive in, in a world where there's, there's so much negative and there's so much uh, that we really don't enjoy or, 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 or wouldn't want to be there. Just, just have your way this morning, Heavenly Father. Speak to us through your, your word um, that we might be reminded of of the reasons for our joy, which do in fact transcend all of this stuff that's going on around us. So uh, have your way, Lord, and, and speak through this message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. A few years ago, there were several less than joyful reactions 
to Christmas that were recorded in the papers. In San Rafael, California, two men exchanged gifts. Neither were particularly happy with what the other one gave in the resulting fight. They both hit each over the head with flower pots and were hospitalized. And a woman in Victoria, British Columbia, found a novel use for her Christmas after the holiday season was over. She was arrested for beating a man over the head with it. Apparently, he complained that he was carrying a larger uh, weight of packages in his arms than she was carrying with the tree, so she decided to impact the weight of the tree on him. There is certainly great joy, however, in the Christmas story. It starts in Luke 1.14. The angel startles Zechariah in the temple to announce the birth of John the Baptist. And he tells him, he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice in his birth. In verse 44, when Mary, bearing Jesus, arrives at the home of Elizabeth, who is now pregnant with John the Baptist, Elizabeth exclaims, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. When Elizabeth gives birth, we read her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And of course, in Luke chapter 2, we have the announcement of Jesus' birth. And the angel told the shepherds, do not be afraid. I give you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior is born. He is Christ the Lord. Birth should bring joy into our lives. We celebrate a new life, a, a new personality, new potential, a, a new relationship, probably new, new gifts and talents. Just a few weeks ago, the Nickums and Teeters found great joy in the birth of twin boys. That, that's something special. And the two births that, the joy, that bring joy in Luke 1 and 2 are no ordinary births. Both were announced by angels. They're both miraculous. An older woman who was beyond childbearing years. And a young woman who had never been with a man. One child would be God's special messenger to prepare the way for the Messiah. And the other would be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. In a sense, Christmas is the joy of birth. The joy of amazing new things. You know, even at its crass and most commercial, Christmas is a celebration of new stuff. New toys, kids and adult versions. A new Mercedes or GMC pickup truck in the driveway. Maybe two. Does anybody really do that stuff? For us as believers, it should never be about the stuff. It should be about the new birth. Our text today is from the book of Zephaniah, one of the so-called minor prophets. We don't spend much time in Zephaniah. Actually, it would be hard to spend a lot of time there. It's only three chapters long. But Zephaniah was a contemporary of Jeremiah, and he wrote not long before Jerusalem was destroyed and Judah was taken into exile. His prophecy begins with words of judgment and terror and destruction. In, in chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both men and animals. I will sweep away the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. The wicked will have only heaps of rubble when I cut off man from the face of the earth. Almost reminds you of the judgment of the flood. He continues to talk about judgment, not only on Judah, but on the nations around them. There's a brief call to repentance in chapter 2. Gather together, O shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives, and that day sweeps on like chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord, Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Then in chapter 3, starting around verses 9 and 10, there is what the writers call the day of hope, or, or God's new day, or what I would prefer, the promise of a new day for God's people. And here Zechariah is, is pointing ahead, past the time of punishment, past the time of exile, past the time of sorrow and suffering to a time of joy, when God's punishment is over, when he gathers his people back into their homeland. 
when he cleanses them, when he provides for them, when he dwells with them again. There are really three different levels of fulfillment that will come to this prophecy. There will be a, a partial and, and very literal fulfillment when the exiles return. There will be a more significant fulfillment when Jesus comes to earth and, and does in fact live among us. And there is the complete fulfillment that will occur when Jesus comes again and takes us to be with him. I want to look at this passage this morning in terms of those to whom the promise belongs, the causes for joy and celebration, and the proper way to celebrate. We'll start with those to whom the promise belongs. First, it's the transformed. It's those who call on the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder. Verse 9 of chapter 3. Then I will purify the lips of the peoples, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder. Judah was overrun and taken captive because the people refused to call on the name of the Lord. And, and they refused to hear His warnings. Seventy years in exile changed many hearts. And that, will, and that allowed God to once again bless and move in their lives. Our, trans, uh, our transformation is less painful. It comes as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. As the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and, and changes us forever. So we call on the name of the Lord and serve Him shoulder to shoulder. I, I love that phrase, shoulder to shoulder. It is a picture of two animals that are, are harnessed together so that they work together as one. We need to serve shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. We need to serve shoulder to shoulder with each other to build the kingdom of God. The promise belongs also to those who, who are forgiven, those whose sins are covered. Verse 11, on that day you will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me. Shame is a word that has almost disappeared in our culture. We don't seem to be ashamed of anything anymore. We excuse, justify, rationalize, even brazenly celebrate things that are shameful. Things that are proclaimed in God's word to be an abomination. Yet sin is a shameful thing. The Old Testament prophets spoke a lot about shame. The shame of idolatry, of unfaithfulness, of violence, of, of other, other shameful acts. Paul wrote about shameful lusts and desires, secret and shameful ways. He said it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. The only way that shame and sin are rightfully eliminated is forgiveness. When the exiles returned to their land, the obvious shame of their exile was eliminated. God was, in a sense, satisfied with their punishment. Through Jesus, our sin and shame are totally covered by His blood, no longer counted against us in any way, and we are cleansed from all unrighteousness. This promise also belongs to the humble, those who renounce self-pride. Verses 11 and 12. I will remove from the city those who rejoice in their pride. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and humble who trust in the name of the Lord. This prophecy puts a great deal of emphasis on this matter of humility. The proud will be removed. The haughty will have no place in this etern God's eternal kingdom. The promise of a new day is for those who are humble enough to receive it. Those who take no pride in, in their own abilities and accomplishments, but who trust solely in the name of the Lord. The Jesus whose birth we celebrate at Christmas has purchased a new birth, a, a new beginning, a new day for all of us. And none of us could have done a thing to accomplish that in and of ourselves. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
That should certainly cause us to lay aside self-pride and humbly submit ourselves to Jesus. It's amazing how often our arrogance and prideful self-reliance get in the way of our joy. And lastly, the promise is for the holy, those who live truthfully. Verse 13, the remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will speak no lies, nor will deceit be found in their mouths. Now this, this picture of moral perfection won't occur until Jesus returns again. We know that. God knows that. However, even though we know we'll never arrive at perfection in this life, that's the mark we need to be pressing toward. We should be genuinely and wholeheartedly seeking to eliminate sin from our lives. We need to be committed to the teachings and the example of Jesus Christ. That's a, a, a vow that we make when we take our baptism. Holiness also means being set apart for God's use. That means, again, that we have to eliminate those things that are self-serving, those things that get in the way of God working and moving in us and through us. And the writer specifically addresses the idea of lies and deceit. We need to be open. We need to be honest. We need to be sincere. There's no room in the life of God's people for misleading others. There's no room for hypocrisy, pretending to be what we clearly are not, if we're going to be holy in any sense of the word. There is room for learning and growing and refusing to settle for less than what God has for us. Beginning in the text that we read, Zephaniah details the causes for this celebration. The causes that we have for joy as God's people. And he mentions that God's judgment has been satisfied. The Lord has taken away your punishment. Again, for the people of Judah, this satisfaction was paid for through 70 years of exile in a foreign land. And so when it was over, there was great joy. God's judgment on our sin was satisfied by the one whose birth we celebrate. He's our sacrifice, our Savior, our sin offering, our, our Passover lamb. He suffered for us. Is that too easy? Is that too simple? Does our lack of suffering limit our joy at what He's done for us? Do we take it for granted? Would, would we value or forgive us more if we had to suffer for it, as the exiles did. In any case, it should be a source of great joy to all of us. In addition, the Lord will live with His people. Verse 15, the Lord, the King of Israel is with you. 17, the Lord your God is with you. In exile, the Jews felt very isolated. Isolated from each other, isolated from God, isolated from their homeland. During this pandemic, we, we probably all in some sense dealt with this idea of isolation. When they would be returned, they would be reunited in their homeland. When the temple was rebuilt and, and they began to worship together again, they would experience God's presence. And as they turned their hearts to Him, He would bless them and, and guide them. He would again be their God and they would be His people. The joy of Christmas is that God came to be with His people. He became Emmanuel, God with us. He was born and raised as one of us. He, he learned and grew and developed as we do. He got sick. He got, he got tired. He suffered and was tempted as we are. He even experienced death. But of course, He also rose again. He also sent His Holy Spirit to live within us. A whole new level of God living with His people. As I was preparing this, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if, 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 if Jesus were, were physically here on the earth, you know, walking around? And, then, and I thought, well, you know, if He was here right now, where would He be? He'd probably be over in, in the Holy Land. So we might see snippets of Him on, on television, maybe hear a message now and again. But because He returned and the Holy Spirit is with us, we have His presence with us all the time, every day. And one day we will see Him face to face and we'll live with Him forever in the kingdom of heaven. 
What a joy as we consider all the facets of that statement, that, that jewel. The Lord will live with His people. Beyond just living with you, God will take delight in you. Verse 17, He will take delight in you. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever thought about God delighting in you? Have you ever thought about God singing because of you? That absolutely amazes me. I can imagine God being angry with me at times. I can imagine Him being, being disappointed at some of my actions and, and attitudes. I, I can be, imagine Him being frustrated with some of my failures. But delighted in me? Joyful in me? That's amazing. We're told that when we leave our sin and when we come to Jesus, there's great rejoicing in heaven. Apparently, God's joy in us doesn't end there. The other part of that phrase is awesome as well. He will quiet you with his love. Thought about that in terms of our, our uh, theme last week, uh, of peace. When everything in our life seems to be in turmoil, we need to allow God's love to quiet our hearts. That should put a smile on our face. That should bring joy to our hearts. God also deals with the all enemies. Verse 15, he has turned back your enemy. Never again will you fear any harm. At that time I will deal with all who oppressed you. For the exiles, that would mean the nations who had overrun and, and, and mistreated them. For us it means Satan and sin. It means death and hell and eternal separation from God. It also means hopelessness and, and frustration, despair, loneliness, a lack of purpose. All those things that Satan uses to discourage us and hold us back. Verse 17 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. And that reminds me of the song, Mighty to Save. It's almost 15 years old now. It's hard to imagine that. But, you know, the words are, the chorus, Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. A more literal translation is the warrior who delivers. God has delivered us from the great enemies of our lives. And the final point for causing joy and celebration is God will restore his people. Again, we know how God restored the exiles. He, he returned them to their homeland. Jerusalem was rebuilt. The temple was rebuilt. And, and the nation. And, and, and he caused them to prosper again. We read about Job and, and Joseph who seemed to lose everything. Only to have God restore so much more than even what they had lost. God restores his people. It's as true today as it's ever been. Yes, we, we suffer losses. We go through valleys. We go through times of frustration and pain and, and sickness and all the other things that are part of this life. But God restores His people, those who hang on to Him, no matter what life throws at them. And again, one day He will restore us to a face-to-face -face relationship where we walk and talk with Him even as they did in a garden of Eden, we should find joy in that anticipation. Lastly, we aren't all that good at celebration. We want to be reserved. We want to be more reverent. At least that's what we claim. Well, no worries. Zephaniah has given us instructions on the proper way to celebrate. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Sing, shout, be glad, rejoice. Oh my. Should we? Sounds rather noisy, but out of control, don't you think? Zephaniah wasn't worried about things getting out of control. And he doesn't seem to be in favor of, of holding ourselves back. He not only tells us to sing, shout, be glad, and rejoice... He tells us to do it with all our hearts. The causes for celebration that we've just been through represent the greatest blessing. 
the greatest deliverance, the greatest salvation, the greatest restoration there could ever be. There should be no greater celebration than the celebration of God's people. I know. Some of you are thinking, well, we'd love to, to sing and worship like that if you let us. Really? I'm not sure that's descriptive of our worship even before the pandemic. In addition, he says, don't be afraid. Do not fear, O Zion. This surely says something about our tendency for fear. The angel comes to the shepherd with great news. But before he can spill his good news of great joy, he has to tell them, do not be afraid. It's hard to be fearful and joyful at the same time. But we've been delivered from the greatest fears of this life and pointed to the greatest hope imaginable. So do so lose the fear and find the joy. And then the last instruction is don't let your hands hang a limp. It's a rather strange sounding piece of advice, isn't it? What's this? What, what, what's it signify? Kind of hopelessness, aimlessness, aimlessness, you know, nothing, nothing really going on here. What is this? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, yeah. A alert. Attention. Trying to get something done. Trying trying to get a point of, across. Some, some kind of, of connection. What's this? Praise. Praise. Worship. Excitement. If you do this, it's a touchdown. But, you know, it's praise and worship and excitement. Worship, praise, joy. That's a great response to Christmas, to what Jesus came to do in our lives. Excitement, connection, moving forward in service to Him. That's a good thing, a joyful thing. This has no place in our celebration of Christmas and even in our lives as, as Christian people. The great news of Christmas was news of great joy. And just in case you, you lost track of what happened to Jesus after his birth, let me fill you in. He accomplished absolutely everything he came to do. All the things that were prophesied. All of the future things that the angel had in mind when he said, talked about good news of great joy. They are all now reality. So great joy. The joy of the Lord should be reality for us as well. So why are there times when joy is so hard to come by? Well, maybe we've taken our eyes off Jesus. Maybe we're fo focusing more on the trinkets, trinkets this world holds out just beyond our reach than we are on the riches that God has already given us in Jesus Christ. Maybe we're so caught up in our, our negative circumstances, the, the frustrations, the confusion, all the things going on in the, the world and the world around us. Again, that we've lost sight of Christ. Maybe we're living far below what Jesus has for us. Our, our, our fellowship with Him has been, been compromised and, and, and neglected. Maybe there's sin in our life. Maybe we're not really living for Him. Maybe we've allowed Satan to beat us up. Even though we have the tools at hand to, to crush him and dispose of him in our lives. All of those things can steal our joy. An unknown author has written, If you will but live up to your privileges, you can rejoice with unspeakable joy. Let me repeat that. If you will but live up to your privileges, you can rejoice with unspeakable joy. In Jesus, we have the greatest blessings, the greatest deliverance, the greatest salvation, the greatest restoration, and the greatest privileges that there could ever be. Let's live accordingly and take hold of the good news of great joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you.
for the joy of your birth. The joy that is ours because you came, because you lived as one of us, you experienced death, but you rose again. And you hold out to us all the promises of the kingdom, all of the riches of your grace. What an incredible thing that is. What a joyful thing that is. Help us to allow that reality to transcend the temporary reality of this world, of the problems, of the struggles, of of all that's going on around us. Help us truly to find, experience, and live out our joy in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Closing meditation is the hymn joy of the Lord. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.